Welcome back, my name is Arya and I don't waste your time, so let's get straight into it. Ladies and gentlemen, in today's video, I have a bit of a different one and I don't like to typically make these type of videos where I'm hypercritical of stocks and all that type of stuff, but I think this is a video that is necessary to be made. We're gonna talk about the absurdly high valuation of Costco and additionally, we're gonna go over why I think this could pose as a potential risk not from an execution perspective for Costco, but more so from a valuation perspective on a going forward basis that could possibly lead to underperformance. Before we dive deep into the video today, I do wanna to preface this by saying I absolutely love Costco. I'm willing to bet that I love Costco more than any of you guys watching this video. I go there multiple, multiple times a, a month, a year. I absolutely love Costco. This is not a hit piece on the company itself, more so a fair warning against the absurdly high valuation that the business actually trades at. Now, to kind of set the stage with today's video, I want to actually refer to one of my underappreciated videos. And I, I did this on valuation because I was getting a lot of questions about the spreadsheet that I include in every single one of the videos. And so th this video really talks about that and among other things. And the reason why I want to include it in today's video is because of this analogy that I use inside the video. And uh, I use an analogy to kind of go about how the market reflects valuation onto a business. So I'm just gonna play the clip and then we're gonna talk about it. Over here, we're gonna have time. This here's gonna be time. And I've always had like five years, 10 years, 15 years, right? And then I'm gonna do two companies here. We got company one. So company one, let's just say it's something like a, like a retailer, like an Alta Beauty, right? The high degree of confidence, you could probably say, okay, you know what? Alta Beauty or Starbucks or whatever, they're gonna keep opening these stores. It's a business that is gonna consistently grow for at least the next couple of years. With a high degree of confidence, you're able to say that this business is going to roughly grow at, let's just say, 15% over the next five years, right? But past that, you really don't know what's going to happen. Is Sephora going to start taking market share from Alta Beauty? Or is uh, McDonald's going to start taking market share from Starbucks, right? All these different things you don't really know past the three to five, maybe even seven year mark. You could perhaps uh, analyze different secular trends, such as more people being willing to buy from quick service restaurants and all that type of stuff. But on a more general note, it's a complete question mark whether or not Alta Beauty's growth rate in 10 years from now is going to be even similar to what it is today. Today, Microsoft is an extremely predictable company. You know that it's roughly growing at 15% today, and odds are in 10 years from now, it's going to grow at 15% again. And maybe it slows down over time because, I don't know, cloud gets more mature, but odds are it doesn't slow down much, right? It has massive secular tailwinds behind it. And on top of that, they have massive pricing power whereby they're able to increase prices on their office suite and all that type of stuff over time, and people are happy to pay it. How do we know that? Because it's happened over the past 30 years. Okay, take two, because I was on mute that whole time. With valuation, it's simply a reflection of what the market thinks about the durability, resiliency, and the amount of growth that this business is benefiting from. So in the case of Microsoft, for example, it is growing pretty fast, right? Growing at roughly 15%. So check on that front. Additionally, it's a very resilient business, a very durable business. We know that these cash flows are basically eternal because people are going to use the office suite. They're going to uh, use Azure services. They're going to use all these different subscription services, right? So check on that front. And additionally, on top of having a very high certainty of these fast growing cash flows, we have an extremely long runway of growth that we expect Microsoft to be producing cash flows for. And if you're, of course, I think everybody should be a proponent of every business or every asset for that matter is the discounted value of all its future cash flows. Then in the case of Microsoft, it deserves a pretty high multiple. Something like Ulta Beauty on the other hand, which is just simply a retailer at the end of the day, doesn't really deserve that high of a multiple because for something like Alta Beauty, we don't have the same expectations. Sure, they might be growing at whatever percent. Maybe in some cases, Alta might have even been growing faster than Microsoft, but the durability to the resiliency, the long runway of growth isn't there. So the reflection of the market assigning it a PE multiple is lower than Microsoft because of all those different factors. You could honestly just sum this up to the moat of the company, right? Like if, if it has a very wide moat, which gets it, all those different qualities, the long runway of growth, the high growth rate, all those different things, then the multiple is probably going to be higher and vice versa for something like Alta Beauty, which has a narrower moat than something like Microsoft. Now, moving on again, I want to preface this. This is not a hit piece on Costco, the company itself. This is simply just talking about are these expectations that we're building into this multiple, are, are these even reasonable, right? And we could do that if we compare it to historical valuation among some other things. So just for starters, just to kind of set the stage, Costco is incredible business, right? And they're trading at literal all-time highs, right? We could even extend this chart. You can see that it's trading at the exact all-time high it's ever traded at. And as you can see, it's not necessarily that the earnings per share growth and all that type of stuff is just absolutely incredible. That's what has driven the stock performance over the past decade. More so, the PE multiple, the free cash flow multiple has doubled in the past decade. And on FinChat, very handy 
feature that they have here is you could actually go and click on, for example, the price of free cash flow multiple, right? I, you guys know I, I like using the price of free cash flow multiple, right? Because cash flow is ultimately what you own as an investor. You're able to see that roughly 10 years ago, they were trading at like a mid 20s uh, free cash flow multiple. Right now, they're trading at roughly 50 times. During December of 2022, they actually traded up to a 80 times multiple. But I think that's skewed because of some the, the timing of cash flows being weird, all that type of stuff. I think if you were to chuck the PE multiple instead over here, you would be able to see that, it, yeah, it's a little bit more smoothed out. So, sure, they, they were expensive at that time right here, but. Not even too expensive. But anyways, as you can see, I, th I think actually maybe the PE multiple does a better job at showing us the historical valuation over time. So you can see it's at like 53 times PE multiple and a decade ago, it was literally half. So let you know what? Let's do this too, right? So if we put the 10-year returns, you're able to see that it has done 640% in the past decade because the PE has doubled. If the PE were to stay the same from 10 years ago until today, you would literally have half those returns. Because the multiple has, because investors have bid up the earnings that this company is producing higher and higher, they're willing to pay a higher premium on the earnings that Costco is able to produce, which rightfully so, incredible business model. I'm absolutely not discounting that. But because they're willing to pay this premium, your returns have literally doubled in the rear view mirror looking backwards 10 years ago. And this is probably a flaw that I, I see everywhere with uh, all different types of investors. Just because the stock has done incredibly well in the past, doesn't mean it's going to continue in the future. Additionally, you have to understand where those returns are coming from. If the returns are coming from just pure earnings per share growth of that business, continuously being selling to more people and selling to more people in new locations, that's incredible. If the stock performance is purely driven based off the growth of the business, that's absolutely what you want from an investor perspective. But if the growth of the business is coming because newer investors are placing a higher bid on the same cash flows that you bought years ago, I think that's a little bit worrisome particularly in the case of Costco, which I'm not a big fan of analyst estimates, but in the case of Costco, it makes sense because they're just a very resilient uh, business and they're very predictable business at that. So when you look at analyst expectations, usually it comes out to correct. So anyways, let's just use them as a rough estimate. You're buying a business that trades at a 53 price to earnings ratio, meaning that if they were to not grow their earnings per share, you get your payback in 53 years. So your investment today will be returned back to you in 53 years. And their earnings per share long-term growth estimate. This means in the roughly next three to five years, this is the expectation by analysts. Again, big caveat, take it with a grain of salt, is only expected to grow at 9%. To just give you an idea, right? Just to give you an idea. And we're not even going to go too far. We're not going to compare it to a tech company. We're not going to compare it to Google. None of that, right? Let's just compare it to Alta Beauty. And I understand the moat is significantly narrower. But Alta trades at a 15 PE ratio, right? So less than a third, right? Like roughly around like 26, 7% of where Costco's at. And they're actually growing faster, or at least they're expected to grow faster than Costco. So again, you have to sit there, you have to weigh in the two different items here, right? And if you're a shareholder of Costco from the past, maybe that's different. Maybe there's tax implications and all that, all that type of stuff. Maybe you don't even want to sell. Costco's a durable company. I'm going to hand these shares off to my kids whatever the case is, right? But I'm saying as a new investor going into either Costco or Alta, and you need to be a believer of $1 earned in Alta is equal to $1 earned in Costco. Sure, there might be blow up risks with Alta. And maybe, you know, if the consumer gets bad, they're going to pull back on their Alta spending. Costco, not so much. Their subscription, incredible business, not discounting that. But nonetheless, like you got to weigh these two different risks. Is it okay to maybe assume a little bit more execution risk from Alta, maybe discretionary um, spending cuts back a little bit, whatever the case is, or are you really going to buy Costco at the all-time high valuation it's ever traded at in its history? Not to mention, there's no material change in the business. It's just been growing the 10% revenue. They don't increase margins. They do their little buyback, whatever the case is, and they just grow the 10% EPS. They've done that for like 30 years, right? So the reason why there's a premium on the stock is because it's, growing to, it's going to grow at 30 years till the literal end of time. The cash flows that that business is able to produce are eternal. That's how the market is reflecting that, right? So again, I need you to ask yourself, is it okay to assume a little bit execution risk on Alta and perhaps make your money that way? Or are you literally going to buy it at the all-time high valuation and take a massive amount of valuation risk? And you guys might be sitting there thinking, oh, well, Arya, it's it's Costco. Like, we're talking about Costco here. It has eternal cash flows. Sure, the multiple might move around, but this is a quality business that we need to buy, no matter the price, because you 
you just buy, don't forget about valuation, forget about valuation. We buy quality investments and we hold for a really long time. Arya, don't you like Devcantis Arya? Doesn't Devcantis Arya always talk about that? And to counteract that, I have an example. So Buffett actually, in later years, he talks about how he regrets not trimming or at least selling partially the Coca-Cola stake that he had in uh, the early 2000s, right? And so just to give you an idea here, right? Coca-Cola, which is a, a company that Buffett has held for like decades and decades, compounding, whatever, never sell, don't ever go near the sell button, whatever the case is, right? Coca-Cola in the year 19, 1998, they did about 45 cents of uh, earnings per share and the stock price was roughly in the 22 range, right? So that lands you at roughly like a 50, 60 times multiple, similar to where Costco is at now, right? So about a 60 times multiple at the peak of 1998, that's when the uh, Coca-Cola price peaked, right? And Buffett in later years actually talks about how he regrets not trimming it. Now, Coca-Cola is an incredible company. This is another company that I, I think has absolutely just eternal cash flows, right? But at the time, it wasn't growing that fast. And sure, the cash flows are eternal, sure, compounding, whatever the case is, right? Quality investments. But when you are given a chance and given an opportunity to sell a company at that high of a valuation, where the amount of growth that the business could reasonably be able to produce just doesn't even make sense, I think you should take that opportunity. If I had Costco shares, I would have sold them at 700. I would have sold them a while ago. It, when it was approaching the 50 multiple, I would have just sold it. Because I'm not gonna hold a company that is growing in the high single digits, but yet the premium that is placed on the multiple of that company exceeds many software businesses. You could literally sell Costco and buy Microsoft at all-time high valuations, right? Microsoft is at like $440 a share, whatever the case is, and it's at like a 36 PE, something like that, right? You could sell Costco and your opportunity cost is owning more Microsoft right now. And you could sell Costco and literally put it into anywhere and in my opinion, I think you're probably making the better investment decision. Now, of course, not financial advice, but just something to chew on. And again, I understand there's different case by case. Maybe you're holding these shares to hand them off to your kids. Your uh, yield on cost might be incredibly high. I have no idea, but just something to chew on, just something to think about, a fair warning. The valuation of Costco today doesn't make any sense. In fact, if we were to jump over to my spreadsheet, which I like to include in all my videos, long story short, we're taking the current valuation of the business and we're dividing it by how fast we expect the company to grow at. And we, we do this with cash flows, by the way. And if you look at Costco, it's the second most expensive company in my investable universe, right? It's right up there with Synopsys. And Synopsys, if you didn't know, they do, they have software for the design of semiconductors, right? And this is another company that is just viewed as having eternal cash flows, right? They're just going to be able to produce cash flows until the literal end of time, just because they have a monopoly on that front, whatever the case is. And they trade at 112 times price to free cash flow, but their growth rates are a little bit higher, right? And even with Costco, let's just put the 9% that we were able to see on FinChat just a second ago, you can see that it even gets a little bit more expensive. So you're buying it at like over six times what the growth rate of the business is on a cash flow basis, right? And not to mention PE and whatever absurd valuation it trades out over there. So again, just something to chew on, just something to think about. You should honestly be happy that people are willing to take these shares off your hands at such a premium. And at last, if you like the fact that I don't waste your time, I'm gonna ask you to do something that costs you nothing. If you can hit the subscribe button, I'm gonna continue to post high quality videos just like this one. And you can always go back on a decision if you end up not liking the videos, but I highly doubt that. Thank you for watching and have a great day.